Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, Namaskaram. I am Dr. Vijay Sagar, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy at the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute in Chennai. In this lesson, I will be talking about the gross anatomy of the kidneys. The kidneys, as you might be aware, are important components of the excretory system along with the ureters, the urinary bladder and urethra. Being important components in the vital functioning of the human body, the kidneys are host to a number of disease pathologies and clinical entities. After the completion of this lesson, we will be reviewing some of the common clinical conditions associated with the kidneys. We will be discussing the referred pain of the kidneys. We will be talking about the renal calculi, which are kidney stones, which are fairly common. The kidneys have a certain amount of mobility and excessive mobility of the kidneys leads to a condition called as nephrotosis or floating kidneys. We will also examine some of the common surgical approaches which a surgeon uses to approach the kidneys. We will talk briefly about renal transplantation and we will also discuss some of the common congenital conditions which are associated with the kidneys. This lesson on the kidneys will be dealt with in the following subheadings. We will first have a brief introduction of the kidneys. Then we will see the location, size, shape, poles, borders and surfaces, that is the various parts of the kidneys. Then we will review the internal structure of the kidney, following which we will study the coverings of the kidney, the important anatomical relations, anterior relations and posterior relations. We will review the important blood supply, the nerve supply, lymphatic drainage and finally the applied aspects of the kidneys. So let's start from the beginning. The kidneys, as you know, mainly function in filtering the blood, removing excess water and toxic products of protein metabolism and add back into circulation the useful electrolytes and salts. The kidneys develop retroperitoneally and are located on either side of the vertebral column in relation to thoracic vertebra 12 till lumbar vertebra 3. The right kidney is slightly lower as compared to the left kidney. The kidneys measure on an average uh, that with dimensions of 10 centimeters in length, 5 centimeters in breadth and 2.5 centimeters in thickness. The weight, each kidney weighs approximately 135 to 150 grams and the kidneys are slightly mobile during respiration. They have a certain amount of mobility in an up and down manner that is a superior inferior direction during the various phases of respiration. Coming to the external features, each kidney has an upper pole and a lower pole. This if you see in this picture, this is the upper pole. The upper pole is more medial as compared to the lower pole which is located a little laterally. The upper pole is slightly more broader as compared to the lower pole and the upper pole is closely related to a very important structure here, which is the suprarenal gland. Each kidney has two borders, a medial border, which is concave towards the midline, and a lateral border, which is convex towards the outer side. The medial border shows a slit-like structure here, a slit-like opening. This opening is called as the hilum. The hilum is the place where the structures enter and leave the kidney. And if you look at this place, the hilum is occupied anterior posteriorly by the renal vein in front, behind which is the renal artery, and finally posterior mostly located is the ureter. Each kidney shows two surfaces, an anterior surface which is convex and a posterior surface which is relatively flat. The anterior surface shows a certain amount of lobulation which is a remnant from the fetal lobulated kidney. 
Now coming to the renal hilum, the renal hilum as we discussed previously is the place where the structures enter and leave the kidney. The structures of the hilum anteroposteriorly include the renal vein anteriorly, the renal artery a little posterior to the renal vein and posterior most is the ureter. The, if you look at this particular picture, this medial slit in the kidney is the hilum and the hilum leads into a empty space within the substance of the kidney. This empty space within the substance of the kidney is called as the renal sinus. Renal sinus is the expanded portion which contains certain important structures. These include the renal pelvis, the major calysis, the minor calysis and a certain amount of fat which is located in the renal sinus. Now coming to the coverings of the kidney, each kidney has two capsules, an inner true capsule which is a derivative of the condensed portion of the parenchyma of the gland. Outside the true capsule is a layer of fat which is called as the perirenal pad of fat. Outside the perirenal pad of fat is the false capsule which is derived from the renal fascia. The renal fascia sends septa out into the adjacent layer of fat which is outside which is called as the paranephric pad of fat. The paranephric pad of fat is especially abundant in the abdominal regions. To review the coverings of the kidney, the kidney has an outer true capsule which is a condensation of the outer parenchyma of the gland. Outside the true capsule is a pad of fat which is called as the perinephric pad of fat and outside the perinephric pad of fat is the false capsule which is derived from the renal fascia and outside the renal fascia or the false capsule is the paranephric pad of fat. Now if you have a look at this particular picture, this is the kidney showing the hilum facing medially. Now if you look closely, this fascia which is extending from the tip of the transverse process including uh, enclosing this muscle, the erector spinae is what is called as the thoracolumbar fascia. This thoracolumbar fascia sends out a facial partition which encloses the kidney. This is what is called as the false capsule or the capsule which is formed by the renal fascia. This renal fascia extends medially as an anterior layer and a posterior layer. So if you see in the kidney here, the peripheral part of the kidney is compressed to form the true capsule which is a condensation of the parenchyma of the gland. Outside the true capsule is the perirenal fat. Outside the perirenal fat is the renal fascia or the false capsule. And outside the perirenal fat and the renal fascia is the pararenal pad of fat. This picture is again showing the various facial coverings of the kidney. This is the outer true capsule of the kidney, the perirenal fat, the renal fascia. Note that the renal fascia extends medially and, con and connects with its fellow of the opposite side, enclosing the iota and the inferior vena cava here. The anterior layer of the renal fascia is also called as the fascia of told and the posterior layer of the renal fascia is also called as the layer of Zucker candle. This intermediate space between the anterior layer and the posterior layer is called as the interrenal space and occasionally there is a partition which extends from the anterior layer of the renal fascia to the posterior layer and this renal arrangement of the renal fascia prevents sideways mobility of the kidneys. The kidneys cannot move from side to side because of the firm attachment of the renal fascia all along its lateral side, anterior side, posterior side and the medial side. However, the kidneys have a certain amount of mobility in a supero inferior direction that is because of the way the renal fascia is arranged. If you see on the horizontal disposition, there is a facial partition which extends from the anterior layer of the renal fascia to the posterior layer of the renal fascia and this limits its sidewards mobility. But however, if you look at this particular picture, the diaphragmatic fascia from the undersurface of the diaphragm extends downwards and splits to enclose the suprarenal gland. Then it sends a fa facial partition between the anterior layers and posterior layers and the, these two layers continue downwards and fade away imperceptibly into the posterior abdominal wall in the lower parts. 
which means that there is no facial partition here which is restricting the mobility of the kidneys. So there is a certain amount of mobility which is present which allows the kidneys to move up and down during respiration to a tune of about the breadth of one vertebral body. The structures which support the kidney in place include the renal vessels which hold it in place, the ureter, the perinephric pad of fat, the renal fascia, the attachment of the renal fascia which does not allow it to move sideways and in addition there are the septa of the renal fascia which extend outwards into the paranephric fat and these also anchor the kidney in position. With this we come to the important aspect of the study that is the relations of the kidney. In this picture this is the right kidney from the anterior aspect and this is the left kidney from the anterior aspect. The left kidney is located a little higher as compared to the right kidney. Both the kidneys on the upper parts are related to the suprarenal gland separated by a facial partition from the renal fascia. The right kidney on its upper part of the anterior surface is related to the liver and is separated from the liver by a peritoneal recess which is called as the hepatorenal recess. The lower part of the anterior surface of the kidney is related to the colon and the small intestine and a C-shaped area near the hilum of the kidney is related to the second part of the duodenum. This of course are the ureters which are coming out from the renal hilum. So the anterior relations of the right kidney include the suprarenal gland, the liver separated from the kidneys by the hepatorenal recess, the colon, the coils of the small intestine and the duodenum. On the left side, the upper pole of the left kidney is similarly related to the suprarenal gland separated by a facial partition. A triangular area below that is related to the stomach. This outer area is related to the spleen. A horizontal area across the hilum is related to the pancreas. The lower part of the anterior surface of the left kidney is related to the colon and the small intestine. So to summarize, the left kidney is related to the suprarenal gland at its apex. A triangular area is related to the stomach here. The spleen is related in the upper lateral parts. A central broad area is related to the pancreas. The lower part of the anterior surface of the left kidney is related to the colon and the small intestine. With this we now come to the hepatorenal recess which we discussed. The hepatorenal recess is a pouch of peritoneum which is present between the kidneys and the liver. If you look at this particular picture, this is a sagittal view and this is the parietal peritoneum lining the posterior abdominal wall. This parietal peritoneum covers the kidney from front and then reflects back onto the liver as the visceral layer of peritoneum. This recess which is present between the liver and the kidney is called as the hepatorenal recess and normally it does not contain any amount of fluid but it is the site of accumulation for fluid in cases of ascites, hemoperitoneum and dialysate. It is the most dependent part of the body when the body is lying supine. If you look at this particular picture, any excess fluid in the peritoneal cavity will tend to accumulate here in the hepatorenal pouch and some amount of it will gravitate into the true pelvis. We now come to the posterior relations of the kidneys. This is the posterior aspect of the left kidney. This is the posterior aspect of the right kidney. And note that the right kidney is at placed at a slightly lower level as compared to the left kidney. The posterior relations, unlike the anterior relations, are more or less similar in both the right and the left kidneys. The posterior surface of the left kidney is related to two ribs, that is, the 11th rib and the 12th rib since it is placed a little higher whereas the posterior surface of the right kidney is related only to the 12th rib. The upper parts of both the right and the left kidneys are related to the diaphragm along with the medial and ar lateral arcuate ligaments of the diaphragm. The lower part of the posterior surfaces of both the kidneys are related to three sets of muscles. On the medial aspect is a muscle called the psoas major. A little lateral to it is another muscle which is called as the quadratus lumborum. And further laterally is another muscle, the aponeurosis of the transversus abdom abdominis. 
The posterior surface of both the kidneys are related to the subcostal vessels and nerves, the iliohypogastric nerve and the ilioinguinal nerves which descend obliquely from the posterior aspect. So on the posterior aspect, the subcostal vessels and nerves, the iliohypogastric nerve and the ilioinguinal nerve run downwards and laterally from below the medial and the lateral arcuate ligaments. We have not discussed one important posterior relation. This includes the pleural recesses. In the midclavicular line, the lowest limit of the pleural recess extends downwards till the eighth rib in the midclavicular line, till the tenth rib in the mid axillary line, and till the twelfth rib on the posterior aspect. This is a very important relation that is, the line of pleural extension extends downwards till the twelfth rib on either side of the midline. The twelfth rib sometimes can be very short and can be absent and in which case the eleventh rib can be mistaken for the twelfth rib. One of the common incisions for approaching the kidneys is a posterior lumbotomy in which an incision is given below the twelfth rib. In a situation where the twelfth rib has not been counted correctly or where the twelfth rib is very small or where the twelfth rib is not present, it is quite possible for a surgeon to mistake the 11th rib for the 12th rib and give an incision below the 11th rib, in which case the pleural cavity will inadvertently get open. So this is a very important relation which you need to keep in mind that the pleural recesses on the posterior aspect extend downwards till the 12th rib on either side of the midline. Now coming to the internal structure of the kidney, if you cut the kidney along with the naked eye, you will be able to see two distinct parts of the kidney. These include the outer cortex and the inner medulla. If you look at this picture, this outer part is the cortex and the triangular areas inside comprise the medulla. The outer part of the cortex has again two components. There is a part of the cortex which is outside the medulla or peripheral to the medulla and this place is called as the cortical arch. There are places where the cortex extends between adjacent medullar, medullary pyramids and these places are called as the renal columns. The medulla comprises of the renal pyramids and there are extensions of the pyramids which extend outwards into the cortex. These are called as the medullary rays. The ureter and the medial aspect, this is the ureter which expands upwards into a funnel shaped portion which is called as the renal pelvis. Each renal pelvis further divides into two to three major calices. This is a major calyxia, this is another major calyxia, this is another major calyxia. Each major calyx further divides into two to three minor calyces and the apex of the pyramids open into the minor calyces. So to summarize, the internal structure of the kidney shows two components. There is an outer cortex and there is an inner medulla which is in the shape of medullary pyramids. The cortex again has two components. The part of the cortex which is overlying the medullary pyramids is called as the cort cortical arches and the part of the, pyramid, uh, part of the cortex which is present between adjacent medullary pyramids is called as the renal columns. The medullary pyramids open into the, mi into the minor calyces. The upper expanded portion of the ure ureter is called as the pelvis. Each pelvis divides into two to three major calyces and each major calyces opens further divides into two to three minor calyces into which the medullary pyramids open. Now there are two important entities which you will come across uh, in clinical practice. One is a renal lobe and one is a renal lobule. It is very important for you to remember that the renal lobe is a gross anatomical entity while the renal lobule is a histological entity. What is a renal lobe? A renal lobe is a gross anatomical entity. It consists of a single pyramid with its associated overlying cortical arch and associated medullary rays. What is a renal lobule? Renal lobule is a histological entity. It is a functional unit which comprises of a single collecting duct along with all the nephrons which drain into that single collecting duct. So that is the difference between renal lobes and renal lobules. We now come to the arterial supply of the kidneys. 
The kidneys, as you know, have an abundant blood flow, sometimes to the tune of uh, 1.1 liter per, of blood per minute. This translates into approximately 25% of the cardiac output being in the renal circulation at any given point in time. The renal vessels are wide board vessels and they are branches of the uh, iota and the inferior vena cava. The renal arteries originate from the iota at the level of L2, that is the second lumbar vertebra. The renal veins drain into the inferior vena cava. The right renal artery is longer and passes behind the inferior vena cava. The left renal vein is longer and passes in front of the iota. Now, the, each of the renal artery, as it enters the hilum, divides into branches which are called as segmental arteries. These segmental arteries are end arteries and supply specific portions of the kidneys. Let us see what are the segmental arteries which are present in the kidneys. Each renal artery divides into five segmental end arteries. These include the apical branch, the anterior superior branch, the anterior inferior branch and the inferior branch. These are the, bra these are the segments of vascular segments of the kidney and the arteries are called as the branch to the apical segment, the branch to the anterior superior segment, the branch to the anterior inferior segment and a branch to the inferior segment. This is the anterior aspect of the left kidney and this is the posterior aspect which is supplied by the posterior segmental artery. All these arteries, as I had mentioned, are end arteries, that is, the blood supply is purely from the posterior segmental artery and there is no overlap of circulation from other segmental branches. This is the pattern of circulation of the renal blood vessels. Each renal artery, as we had discussed just now, divides into segmental arteries. Each segmental artery divides and forms a lobar artery, which in turn forms an interlobar artery which in turn continues as the arcuate artery. The arcuate artery further gives rise to the interlobular artery, which forms the afferent arteriole, which goes on to form the glomerulus within the Bowman's capsule. From the glomerulus, the efferent arteriole emerges out and forms a peritubular plexus from which the interlobular vein is formed. Interlobular veins unite to form the arcuate vein. Arcuate veins form the interlobar veins which in turn form the lobar veins and finally the segmental veins which unite to form the renal veins. Now, a large number of arterial variations are usually present in almost up to 25% of population. This is because the kidneys originally develop retroperitoneally in the pelvic region and ascend up to their adult positions. During this ascent upwards, they receive blood vessels from successively higher vessels and the lower vessels degenerate as the higher vessels take over. Occasionally, the lower vessels may persist and these vessels persist as accessory renal vessels and the accessory renal vessels can be classified as polar renal vessels, polar accessory renal vessels or hilar accessory renal vessels. Now, these are some of the common arterial variations you can see a low accessory renal artery passing in front of the inferior vena cava. Normally, the renal arteries pass behind the right renal artery, passes behind the inferior vena cava. You have a low accessory renal artery passing in front of the inner inferior vena cava and going towards the hilum of the kidney. The inferior phrenic artery is usually a branch of the iota, but in this particular case, the inferior phrenic artery along with the suprarenal arteries are originating from the renal artery. Sometimes there is a proximal subdivision of the renal arteries, that is the renal artery as it emerges out from the iota immediately breaks up into segmental arteries. This is what is called as a proximal subdivision. Usually the renal artery enters the hilum of the kidney before it breaks up into these segmental branches. But in this particular condition, you can see that the renal artery has divided into its segmental arteries much before it has entered the renal hilum. Coming to the venous drainage, the renal veins are wide board veins which drain into the inferior vena cava. The left renal vein is longer as compared to the right renal vein and the, renal, the left renal vein passes in front of the iota. 
Some variations are also present with respect to the venous circulation. There can be multiple renal veins that is more than one vein. You can have a double left renal vein that is one part of the renal vein passing in front of the iota and another renal vein passing behind the iota and joining with the anterior vein thus forming a venous ring around the iota. You can also have a persistent left inferior vena cava. This is an embryonic structure, a persistent left inferior vena cava which is dra draining into the left renal vein. Now coming to the important nerve supply, the kidneys are supplied with nerves from the renal nerve plexus. The renal nerve plexus consists of both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers of the autonomic nervous system. And the renal plexus is essentially supplied by nerves from the abdominal pelvic splanchnic nerves, most importantly the least splanchnic nerve. Now visceral afferent fibers carrying sensations of pain and distension from the kidney are carried to the spinal cord segments T11 to L2 that is they reach the spinal cord segments that is the 11th thoracic segment, the 12th thoracic segment, the first lumbar segment and the second lumbar segment. Now pain from the kidneys and the ureters is referred to the skin segments which are supplied by the same thoracic spinal cord segments that is T11 to L2 that is the skin areas extending from the loin which is the lumbar region to the groin which is the inguinal region. This is the area of referral of the kidney pain to the loin area and in case of ureteric pain some of the pain radiates from the loin to the groin that is from the lumbar region to the inguinal region. The lymphatic drainage of the kidneys is to the lateral aortic group of lymph nodes which are present on either side of the iota. The ureter, the upper parts of the ureter also drain into the same lateral aortic group of lymph nodes. The lymph from the middle parts of the ureters drain to the common iliac group of lymph nodes whereas lymph from the inferior parts of the ureter drains into the internal iliac group of lymph nodes. Okay, now let's summarize what we have studied so far. The kidneys are important components of the excretory system. They are located in the posterior abdominal wall in relation to lumbar vertebrae T. Uh, so let's have a summary of what we have studied so far. The kidneys are retroperitoneal structures which are located on the posterior abdominal wall. Each kidney is a bean shaped structure with an upper pole, with a lower pole with a medial border, with a lateral border, an anterior surface which is convex and a posterior surface which is flat. Each kidney weighs approximately 150 grams and measures about 10 centimeters in length, 5 centimeters in width and 2.5 centimeters in breadth. We have seen that the kidneys have an internal structure comprising of an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex is further divided into two parts, namely the cortical arches and the renal columns. The medulla or the inner aspect of the kidneys open into the minor calysis. The ureters open up into a funnel shaped expanded portion in the hilum which is called as the renal pelvis. Each pelvis divides into two to three major calysis. The major calysis open into the minor calysis and the renal pyramids open into the minor calysis. We have seen the coverings of the kidney. Each kidney has an uh, outer covering of true capsule which is nothing but the condensation of the parenchyma of the gland. Outside the true capsule is a layer of fat which is the perirenal pad of fat. Outside the perirenal pad of fat is the renal capsule which is made of the renal fascia. And outside the renal fascia is the pararenal pad of fat. We have seen the important relations anteriorly as well as posteriorly. We have also noted that the pleural recess is related down till the 12th rib. We have seen the blood supply which is essentially coming from the renal arteries. These are wide bored vessels which supply almost 25% of the cardiac output to the kidneys. We have seen the nerve supply which is coming from the autonomic plexus in the renal plexus and we have also seen that the pain from the kidneys is referred to skin segments T11 to L2. We have also seen the lymphatic drainage. With this now we come to the 
applied anatomy part of the kidneys. We will be studying these clinical entities. We will be studying what is the renal angle. We will be discussing the renal pain, something about the renal calculi, the anatomical basis of floating kidneys, the various surgical approaches which are used to approach the kidneys, a few aspects of the renal transplantation. We will also discuss some of the common congenital anomalies which include the bifid ureter, the horseshoe shaped kidneys, renal aplasia and polycystic kidneys. So let's begin. The first thing is the renal angle. If you look at this picture, the angle between the 12th rib and the lateral aspect of the erector spinae muscle, this, is, this angle is called as the renal angle between the lower border of the 12th rib and lateral aspect of a muscle group which is present on either side of the midline. That muscle group is called as the erector spinae and this angle between the lower border of the 12th rib and the erector spinae is called as the renal angle. The tenderness in the kidneys is elicited by applying pressure over this renal angle with the thumb. So that is the significance of the renal angle. The next thing is the referred pain from the kidneys. Now what is referred pain? Pain from the viscera is referred to skin areas which receive the same innervation. This pain typically the kidney pain is pain over the loin that is tenderness in the renal angle. Calculi in the ureters can obstruct the ureters and the pain radiates from the loin to the groin. This is the typical kidney pain of ureteric colic or ureteric obstruction in which pain starts in the lumbar region and extends downwards into the groin region. Sometimes the pain can extend into the thigh or the scrate or the labium majus. Now we come to the renal calculi. Renal calculi are basically salts of inorganic or organic acids and the calculi are usually located either in the renal pelvis or they can be located in the ureter or they can be located lower down in the urinary bladder. Now if the calculus is more than 3 mm in size, it usually causes an obstruction in the ureter. Obstruction of the ureter causes severe spasmodic pain with a loin to groin radiation. This is the pain which is felt in cases of ureteric colic, a spasmodic pain coming in spasms and extending from the loin to the groin. The pain is referred to the T11 to the L2 segments and the pain is also referred to the proximal thigh, the scrotum and the labia majora because of the involvement of the genitofemoral nerve which has a root value of L1 to L2. The removal of the stones is usually by a small instrument which is called as a nephroscope and lithotripsy is a newer technique which uses shock waves to disintegrate the stones in situ and they pass out harmlessly through the urine. So that is about the renal calculi, it's a fairly common condition. Next we come to the floating kidney, this condition is also called as nephrotosis. Earlier in the lesson we had uh, learned that the kidneys cannot move sideways because of the attachment of the renal fascia which extends from the anterior layer of the renal fascia to the posterior layer of the renal fascia. There is usually a facial partition which does not allow the kidneys sideways mobility. But we have also learned that the diaphragmatic fascia splits to enclose the suprarenal gland, sends a facial partition between the suprarenal gland and the kidney and covers the kidney from the anterior and the posterior aspects and the renal fascia fades away in the lower part of the abdomen and this particular features allows a certain amount of vertical mobility. This ver vertical mobility is normally to the tune of one vertebral body that is about 3 to 5 centimeters. But there are certain instances where the kidneys become unduly mobile and can move up and down this facial sheath and such a condition is called as nephro or a floating kidney. Sometimes this nephrotosis can result in a kinked ureter and the posterior layer of the renal fascia can be sutured to the posterior abdominal wall and the diaphragm thus fixing the kidney in place. So that is about the floating kidney. There are two common approaches to the kidney. The first one is what is called as a posterior lumbotomy that is an incision below the 12th rib extending downwards and outwards. This is the most commonly used incision for the kidney. Occasionally a thoracolumbar 
supra loin 12 inch incision, a thoraco lumbar supra loin 12 inches incision extending from here onto the anterior abdominal wall is done and thus carefully reflecting the parietal layer of the pleural recess, the incision can be used to gain approach to the kidneys. Very rarely an anterior subcostal incision is also used for surgical approach, but by far the commonest approach to the kidney is the posterior lumbotomy and incision below the 12th rib extending in the renal angle here. Renal transplantation is a condition which I am sure most of you must have heard about. One of the common indications for renal transplantation is end stage renal disease, what is also called as chronic renal failure. The kidney is usually sourced from cadaveric donors or live donors and after harvesting the donor kidney is implanted in the iliac fossa. The kidney is not placed in its original location but the donor kidney is placed in the iliac fossa and the renal vessels are anastomosed with the external iliac vessels. Now there are very effective medications for suppressing the graft rejection and the one year survival rates for such transplanted kidney, kidneys now have a survival of more than 85%. So that is about the renal transplantation where the donor kidney is implanted into the iliac fossa and the donor vessels are anastomosed to the external iliac vessels of the recipient. Now we will discuss some of the few common congenital anomalies. One of the common congenital anomalies is a bifid renal pelvis and bifid ureters. This is usually due to duplication of the ureteric bud which originates from the mesonephric duct and an incomplete division of the ureteric bud leads to what is called as a bifid ureter and a complete division of the ureteric bud leads to a supernumerary kidney that is an extra kidney present. This condition may be unilateral or bilateral and separate openings into the urinary bladder are very uncommon. So that, that is about the renal uh, bifid renal pelvis and the bifid renal uh, ureters. Now another, there is a not a very uncommon condition where there is a retrocable ureter that is the ureter which is passing behind the inferior vena cava, looping around the inferior vena cava and then coming down into the pelvis. This is the anomalous course of the ureter passing behind the IVC and subsequently crossing the inferior vena cava on its anterior aspect. There is another clinical condition which occurs in approximately 1 in 600 uh, live births and that is what is called as a horseshoe kidney. The horseshoe kidney is one in which the lower ends of the kidneys are fused to each other. Now as we had discussed earlier, the kidneys are formed in the pelvic region and ascend up to their adult positions in relation to the lumbar vertebra. But in this cases, in a case like this where the lower poles of the kidneys are fused to each other, the inferior mesenteric artery prevents the further upward ascent of this fused kidney mass and the horseshoe shaped kidney usually lies below the level of the inferior mesenteric artery at the third lumbar vertebra. Usually a horseshoe shaped kidney does not provide any symptoms. The other common condition is an unascended pelvic kidney. As we had just discussed, kidneys are formed in the pelvis and ascend up to their adult positions. Sometimes it is quite possible that the ascent does not occur and the unascended kidney usually lies anterior to the sacrum and an awareness of this condition is very much required because it can be mistaken for a pelvic mass and removed as a part of a surgery. So it is very, very important to realize that a kidney can remain in the pelvic region without ascending up to its adult uh, position in the lumbar region. In women, such an unascended kidney can get injured or cause obstruction during childbirth. And this unascended kidney usually receives blood supply from the common iliac arteries. Now we come to another condition which is called as the polycystic kidney disease, which is an inherited disorder which is usually autosomal dominant in nature and occurring in the 30 to 40 year old age group. It essentially consists of collections of swellings on the kidneys and causes progressive enlargement on loss of kidney function. It usually manifests as uh, high blood pressure, headaches, fullness of abdomen, blood in urine and kidney stones. And the treatment is essentially to manage symptoms, especially hypertension, giving antibiotics 
low sodium diet, diuretics and surgical drainage of the cysts. Now what you see in my hand is the right kidney. This is the upper pole of the kidney which is located more medially as compared to the lower pole which is placed a little more laterally. This is the outer border of the kidney or the lateral border and this is the medial border. The medial border shows a slit called as the hilum. This is where the structures enter and leave the kidney. The structures on the, from the anterior to the posterior aspect include the thin walled renal vein behind which is the renal artery and further posteriorly is the ureter. The anterior surface of the kidney is convex as compared to the posterior surface which is more or less flattened. This particular st structure, this thin membranous structure which you see is nothing but the true capsule or the outer covering which can easily be stripped off a kidney when the kidney is in a healthy condition. So to review, you have the upper pole which is placed more medially, you have a lower pole which is placed a little more laterally, you have the lateral border which is convex, you have a medial border which is concave towards the inner aspect and the medial border shows a slit like structure which is the hilum through which structures enter and leave the kidneys. These include the renal vein anteriorly behind which is the renal artery and further posteriorly is the ureter. The anterior surface of the kidney is convex. The kidney shows a thin covering here which is the true capsule which is the condensation of the outer parenchyma of the gland and the posterior surface is relatively flat. With this we now come to the end of this lesson on the gross anatomy of the kidneys. In this lesson we have studied the location, size, shape, poles, borders and surfaces. We have seen that the kidney is a retroperitoneal structure. It is a bean shaped structure which is responsible for the filtration of blood. It has a medial border, it has a lateral border, it has a superior pole, an inferior pole, an anterior surface which is convex and a posterior surface which is flat. We have seen that the medial border shows a slit like structure which is called as the renal hilum and we have seen that structures at the hilum include in an anterior posterior direction the renal veins, the renal arteries and the ureters. We have seen the internal structure of the kidneys which essentially consists of the outer cortex and the inner medulla. The cortex is further divided into two parts the cortical arches and the renal columns. The medulla is in the form of pyramids which extend into the minor calices. Some parts of the medulla extend into the cortex as fine lines which are called as medullary rays. We have seen the coverings of the kidneys. The kidney has an outer covering of the condensation of the parenchyma of the gland which is the true capsule. Outside the true capsule is a layer of fat which is called as the perirenal fat. Outside the perirenal fat is the facial covering which is the renal fascia also called as the false capsule and outside the false capsule is the pararenal pad of fat. We have seen the important relations, the important anterior relations, the important posterior relations which are essentially muscles. We have also realized that the pleural recess extends downwards till the lower border of the 12th rib. We have seen the blood supply essentially from the iota, the renal arteries which break up into the segmental arteries. We have seen the venous drainage that is the segmental veins unite to form the renal veins which drain into the inferior vena cava. We have seen the nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage and we have discussed about some of the common clinical conditions which are related to the kidneys. With this we come to the end of this lesson on kidneys. Thank you.